Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the webinar. We're just waiting for a minute for participants to join and then we get started. Okay, we have quite a few people joined us. So once again, very warm welcome to our webinar on connecting the dots networking. And today we have Mr. Luis Miranda with us. I'll quickly introduce Luis to all of you. Luis Miranda realized a few years back that his core competency is networking, his ability to connect the dots. He currently chairs two nonprofits, Center for Civil Society, which is launching the Indian School of Public Policy, and Koro, and runs Take Charge, a mentoring program for Catholic youth in Mumbai. He's also closely involved with Educate Girls, Collective Good Foundation, Sunburn Trust, 17,000 Feet Foundation, and the Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation at Chicago Booth. Prior to that, Luis was involved in setting up two highly successful companies, HDFC Bank and IDFC Private Equity. Luis has spent over two decades raising money and building teams. Luis received an MBA from the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago and is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Uh, thank you so much, Luis, for being with us today. Over to you. Thanks, Priyanka. And uh, well, welcome to the session on networking. Uh, when you know, when you sit down at work and you're struggling with balances, not enough cash in the bank, you're struggling, who do I contact? Life sometimes looks unbearably tragic. And by the way, I'll be using a lot of Calvin and Hobbes cartoons because I think Calvin's this great philosopher who uh, brings in a lot of wisdom. So my point is that life need not be as tough as we think it is. If we were to go ahead and focus on how to do certain things in a different way. So this whole tennis this presentation started off when I was asked by a friend some time back. His wife had started an NGO in Mumbai to work with uh, people with uh, mental challenges and, uh, and counsel them, etc. And we were going on a walk and he said, Lewis, can you come and talk to my colleagues? He runs a consulting firm about how is it that you stay in touch with people. He said that a lot of my colleagues are very transactional. They stay in touch with somebody because they've got a project. But how can you, so how can you teach them how to stay connected over long periods of time like you've done? So I said, sure, I'll do it. And then I realized I didn't know what to talk about because a lot of the things that I do come just naturally to me. So I did what I normally do, which is I asked my wife for help. I remember we were driving somewhere and she was driving and I was taking notes on my phone and I told her, I need to make this presentation. Uh, why don't you tell me what is it that I do when I'm dealing with people and when I'm interacting with them? And uh, so she said, you do this and you do that and you do this. And I was busy taking notes. And then I realized that I now have enough content to be able to talk to them. But again, them being consultants, unless I put something in a framework, they're not going to be able to uh, understand it. So then I said, let me put this to a framework. And, uh, and that's what we're gonna be talking about, this framework that I uh, sort of came up with based on the inputs that Fiona gave me. And uh, as Priyanka mentioned, uh, I also realized from years back that while I've invested and I've sold and I've done a lot of different things, but the companies, my main competency, my main sort of strength really is the ability to network and connect the dots with people. So I'm introducing you to 
the force network which is really an acronym for a badly created acronym for the six factors which we're going to talk about positivity hard work openness relationships consequences and empathy and these arrows are just sort of these lines are just to show everything and uh, and after we discuss these six points we're then going to go and uh, look at some more detailed steps on what people can do to uh, uh, to some macro micro detail on what people can do to network so the first point is positivity and here we're back to calvin the actual full cartoon of this is that calvin is doing a math test and the question is two plus two and he has no idea what it is so he writes down five and he says it's worth a shot I mean, what's the downside of giving an answer? And, and the lesson from this is all about positivity. If you go into a meeting expecting that you're going to get no for an answer, the odds are you're going to get a no for an answer. So you've got to be positive. We're going to talk a little, little later on about, you know, what, how lucky people create the luck for themselves. And it's a lot to do with positivity. Uh, 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 I go back to an example where one of the nonprofits, we were working on a campaign of violence against women and the donor that we had, uh, their commitment was getting over, it was a three year commitment and we had about a year and a half for it to, to go to end. And for a year, the team was talking to various corporate sponsors to fund it and nobody was doing so. So we were at a trustee meeting and uh, and people were talking about you know maybe we, people don't want to do fund violence because of the word violence and and the struggle the team was having in terms of being able to raise money for the program and uh, and I was surprised because this was the time when Nirbhaya was all over the news and every second day on the front page of the paper you'd see some article about violence against women. So to me, I, it didn't make sense that people were not willing to fund it. So I, I told the team, the board, give me, give me a week. Let me see what I can do. So on the next day, which was a Sunday, I sat down and I wrote a simple email to people that I knew who ran some of the large legal firms and accounting firms in the country. The title was, I need your money. And I, told, and I, and I wrote a simple one-page note which said that we have this program, we have counselors, cost us three lakhs a year for a counselor. This was from years back. And uh, we have six counselors. We each, uh, they each do about 80 cases a year. So we have about 500 cases a year. The success rate was 80%, which meant that uh, 400 uh, cases were you know, started, were done satisfactorily during the year. And we define success as the woman doesn't want to kill her husband anymore, or she doesn't want to kill herself, or she's willing to go back home. And uh, we need funding. So if you could uh, let us know how many you will fund and give us a commitment for three years with a 10% inflation. Um, just drop me an email and let me know. I'll send you the details later. That was all. By, next, by Monday morning, we've got the whole program funded. So the point again is, if you approach something with a positive attitude, it's worth a shot, as Calvin says. And in fundraising, in networking, you've got to keep positivity as, in fact, the main thing, main attribute uh, for you as a fundraiser or as a networker. The second is hard work. Staying in touch with people, is a lot of work. For me, it doesn't seem uh, very difficult because I do that all the time, it comes naturally. But possibly in the initial periods of time, there were certain tools that I did and certain things that I did which helped me. So it's like this ballet dancer. You see the ballet dancer dancing so well on stage, doing something great. But what we don't see is the struggles the person has, the bruises, the calluses on her feet because of all the practice that she's been doing over the years to get to where she is today. So there's a lot of hard work which goes into staying in touch with people. The third attribute is openness. I don't know how many of you have learned the story of or told the story of the three little pigs when you were kids. 
So the story goes as this. There were these three pigs. They were friends. And uh, they all had to build a house. The first one was very lazy. So built the house. And then went to play. The second pig was a bit more serious. And, uh, and went across to uh, get some sticks and made a house with sticks. And, uh, and then uh, finished their work and went on to play. The third pig was very serious and very studious. And that pig went and built a house of bricks. And, uh, and, uh, and we, and that, and that, uh, sorry. That pig went on to uh, build a house of stone and brick, and it was very strong, but the kid didn't have time to play. The wolf came along and uh, went to the first house and knocked on the door. The pig wouldn't open the door. The pig huffed and puffed and broke the house down and ate up the pig. Went to the second house, did the same thing. Went to the third house, the pig wouldn't open, kept banging on the door, kind of huff and puff, but the house was a strong house and nothing happened to the pigs. So the pig, so the wolf decided to climb down the chimney to catch the pig and then fell into a pot of hot water and died. So that's the story I grew up with as a kid. I learned the story from the perspective of the three pigs. But I never heard the story from the wolf. So this is a story which I have a book written some time. Two story of the three little pigs from the wolf's perspective. And the wolf was saying that, you know, I was my grand wanted to make soup for my brother. So I went to my neighbor's house and asked for some salt because I didn't have salt. And I knocked on this wolf's door. It was made out of straw. I, uh, because I knocked so hard, the whole house collapsed. And there was a pig dying, uh, dying uh, dead over there on the floor. So I said, why waste it? I ate it up. I still need salt for my grandmother's soup. So I went to the next house. Again, I knocked on the door. And because of all that straw, it started making me sneeze so much that I sneezed so hard that this house also fell down. There was a dead pig over there and I ate it up. And then I went to the third house because I still hadn't got salt for my grandmother's soup. And I uh, knocked on the door and this pig wouldn't open the door. So I asked the pig, can I get some salt and the pigs for my grandmother's soup? And the pig started insulting my grandmother. I got very angry and then I tried to capture, climb into the, uh, through the chimney and then I got stuck and then the wolf, uh, the pig called the police and that's why I'm now in jail. Now, I'll both tell stories, but you see how the story is very different depending on who you heard the story from. And quite often in life, we only want to listen to our point. To not willing to accept the fact that there could be another point of view. And as a result, you have fewer friends because you're challenging everything that they say, or you don't believe what they say, or you believe that you're the only one who's true. Sometimes we don't want to listen at all to the other person's point of view because we think we know everything. So it's important as you network and as you uh, deal with other people, you've got to listen. You've got to be accepting of the fact that there could be another point of view. And that's why it's important to have openness also as you work on networking. The fourth is relationships. We're in this world today where people don't talk to each other, we're just messaging each other. As in this cartoon you see over here, you see, you know, we've been talk we haven't talked much this day, but the, you know, I've, the woman says, you know, I've commented on your Facebook post. That's enough engagement for a day. That's not enough for relationships. We've got to be going away from just being casual in terms of communicating with each other and be more genuine in terms of spending time with people. And I'll talk later about how some of the relationships I've had have been, you know, we haven't met for 10 years, but when we meet again, it's like we never sort of had left. Because of the time and the deep engagement we've had uh, some time. So it's important to spend time with people. And this is important not just for work or with your friends, but also with your family. How do you spend time over there? The next one is consequences. Uh, we see over here Calvin happy and content. And then he suddenly 
says he's not euphoric and therefore he is no longer content and then he walks away saying that you know I, I, well, I thought about it too much I should have walked away when I was ahead quite often we are actually content where we are and uh, we then look at somebody else and then get discontented because they've, they're in a better position or we're always blaming somebody else for the problem we have so if you want to be a successful networker stop blaming other people for not being able to connect with them and take charge of your response own responsibility i remember years back in one of the firms uh, that i was at there's one of my colleagues who kept saying you know i looked at these investments and you guys kept turning it down all the time and see how well they and my response was maybe you didn't sell the investment hard enough to us so instead of blaming everybody else with the problems look at it and say how could you have sold it in a more effective manner to make it useful for uh, for all of us and finally we come to empathy you've got to be empathetic to the other people if you believe that you're the prima donna and everybody else will has to do what you do you're not going to be able to build up a network and you're not going to build up a network of people who you can go to for help or for advice you're not going to be able to raise money successfully because people want to deal with people who have empathy so like Calvin over here who's feeling very sorry for the crayons as they get used uh the fact is that we've got to be empathetic and uh, and think about what is the impact of what we're doing going to have on other people and be caring so this uh, that's the force model positivity hard work openness relationships consequences and empathy that's what i learned when my wife fiona was telling me what are the things that i do and i came up with this framework over here but how do we translate these macro points in some that a framework that you can use and here we come to the slide about connecting the dots the world is complicated and i go back to something that i learned from my dad way back when i was a kid in college and he told me the story about aristotle onassis uh he had the knack whenever he went for a meeting after the meeting on the back of that person's card business card he would write down notes about the meeting and then give it to his assistant the notes would include you know what they talked about that person's wife or whatever and uh, and then uh, when he was meeting the person for the next time he would check the notes from the previous meeting and connect it into the card thing and people would think about what a great person he was he remembered things from the previous meeting so that's when i talk about you know the hard work like that ballet dancer there's a lot of work that's involved in sort of connecting the dots and staying in touch so let's warm up the first one is research the dots the other day i had someone from one of the wealth management firms come to me and uh, we sit down and he starts talking about himself and uh, then asked me about myself and he had mentioned that you know he used to work in hdfc bank and i said you know i used to work in hdfc bank and this guy wasn't aware he had not even done the research about what i done if he was trying to come to me for business so the meeting in my view got over within 3 minutes we talked for another 15 minutes but in my view the meeting was over because he hadn't researched enough about me so before you meet somebody if you're going for a fundraising meeting understand uh, uh what about the person understand about the person's organization look at who they donated money to earlier look at uh, try to find out who some of their donors are what are the causes they support because there's no point you going in for a meeting and suddenly the person turning around is as he the person you know i'm raising money for kids in the northeast and the guy said listen i have nothing to do with the northeast you waste both of your time but if you found out that the person was interested in education in remote places then you turn the pitch into that way so it's important to prepare for meetings research the dots uh you know i've i've been asked this question when i talk to a lot of people in college that do i come out as someone who is a stalker 
does the person on the other side think that you know i've been too he's in the person out by us by the checking on the person i don't see that as i think actually and i see that the person has taken the effort to find out about me and ask relevant questions about my background i'm actually impressed that the person has done the research so i think that you should clearly research uh, about the person to know uh things that are common maybe you all went to the same school maybe you went to the same college maybe you'll find that that person knows some people in common and that's how you sort of uh, can sort of you know weave that into the conversation uh so it's important therefore that you research the dots the second is listen to the dots i've gone into meetings where my colleagues have immediately started giving advice or a lecture on what the company should be doing and they're not bothered to listen to what this killer entrepreneur or donor wants to talk about listen don't go into a meeting with your phone and keep it down over there and check your mail and your whatsapp messages bad idea keep your phone away concentrate listen to what the person is saying take notes if you need to i sometimes have you know find that it's difficult for me to stay attentive for an hour so i take notes because that's a habit that makes me sort of pay attention because i find that if i stop taking notes the mind starts wandering so think what you but it's important to not hear what the person is saying but listen to what the person is saying and it also helps you frame questions about it i remember seeing people having an agenda for a meeting and when the person is responding your next question has no connection to what the person said because you've not listened you're already thinking about what's my next question going to be as opposed to listening to what the person is saying so listen to the dots it's important because it shows that you care you you care about the person the third is don't bore the dots so when you're writing to them when you are talk to them don't ramble on unnecessarily be crisp to the point and uh, say what you want to say and not uh, go all over the place uh, because uh, you lose the person's interest i lose interest very easily so stay focused if you are sending out a mail and appeal don't send a three page note send a one page we did that some time back when we were raising money for a friend of mine who has a non-profit office and we sent i sent just a one simple one page uh, email to raise money for student funding students and you know we raised the money pretty fast because i didn't cover put in a lot of details uh, people don't have time if you tell people look at an annexure i mean i for example would say okay if there's something else i got to read while well, read it later and that later will never come you got the crack uh, to to get that person's attention don't lose that opportunity so if you're writing keep it brief and to the point if you are talking in a meeting don't ramble on unnecessarily and i got to make sure that i don't ramble on over here as i'm talking uh notes and dots take notes keep it in uh, keep it in mind like aristotle on assets after the meeting and today we've got the technology you've got the phone in your in your directory on your phone you have a notes section put down information about the person over there so next time when you're meeting them it's there on your phone it's available you don't have to hunt for some piece of paper later on people on your contacts list you'll have the name of the person the phone number and maybe the email address use put the directory on put the address on put the put in the notes right down a person where they where, where he or she went to school where he or she studied what's the name of his or her wife so when you meet them the next time you can refer to that it's so that you care humor the dots i use a lot of cartoons in my presentations i talk a lot uh people like that you go to a meeting where everyone is too serious it's boring it's dull so use humor that's very important dot stay in touch with people you're going to calcutta check in your address book in your in your contact list who are the people in calcutta is there somebody you haven't met for some time 
dropped him a message saying, listen, I'm going to be in Calcutta. I'm free. You want to meet up? I do that all the time when I'm traveling. And suddenly you realize that there's somebody you haven't met for some time. You have no work with that person. But maybe it's just worth stay in touch. Uh, I recently was in uh, Hyderabad for a, a meeting. And I was going to meet a whole lot of, which was a uh, chairman of insurance companies. And I just went through the names of some of the people who I, uh, so some of the names were not familiar. And it turned out there were two people on that list whose names didn't sound familiar. But when I, you know, checked in my telephone contact list, I realized that these are people I'd met 10 years back. So I go up to them at the meeting yesterday and I say hi and the exchange cards. And I said, you know, I met you in 2009 at our investor conference in Delhi. And the guy looks at me and says, you know, Lewis, I was trying to figure out where I met you earlier. And uh, he thinks that I'm this brilliant guy with this brilliant memory. But no, it's just that I took the effort to search in my telephone book where I had I met these people before. And I have some like 20,000 contacts in my book because I'm, I'm old. And, uh, but that's very the importance of, you know, working the dots, using them uh, to stay in touch with them. Work dots beyond work. You don't need to even to talk about work. You can meet them outside for a, for a coffee, for a drink, uh, talk to them about stuff that is not necessarily related to work. And for example, when you look at them in LinkedIn, you know, what are their different interests? Talk about that. So then you're building up a relationship. You're not just looking at a transactional where you are only talking about the deal on hand or the need to raise money. Build up a way that the person wants to stay connected with you as a person and not just for that particular transaction. Make the dates long dated. And I've got a lot of stories about people who I have met for years. And, uh, and when we come across each other, you know, we've, uh, we're willing to help each other. So there's one particular person who I first met when we launched HDFC Bank in 2000, in, sorry, in 1994, 95. We had a party and I met this particular person and there was no business need for me to stay in touch with that person. But whenever I went to Delhi, I'd stay in touch every month. And, uh, and then he moved back uh, to uh, some other state and we lost touch with each other. Uh, about nine years later, eight, nine years later, when we were at IDFC, we were looking at a transaction and uh, when I asked my colleague, when the colleague was mentioning who the, the managing director was, I said, that name sounds very familiar. And um, so I Googled the name and I found it's the same person I hadn't met for eight, nine years. So I called him up and I said, you know, hi, you know, we met up eight, nine years back at this place and he remembered me and we got talking and we in, ended up investing in this person's company. And then again, you know, we, we moved on, we moved on, we took the company public, we exited that investment. And, uh, and then about another 10 odd years later, when we were raising money at a new fund that I was at, I come across him again. And, uh, because we, you know, we've stayed, we, we had great interactions in the 90s, and then a decade later, uh, we, you know, he, we, we connected again, and he became an investor in me. So through different stages, we've we managed to keep those relationships going, and I have a lot of situations like this. As you grow older, the people remember that the junior people that you knew when you were a junior are also going to become senior in organizations. Today, I, I know some people who are chairman of banks, the largest junior was also a junior. So as I grew, they also grew. And these relationships are very important. And finally, reply to the dots. People, if you don't reply back to emails, you're not going to be able to stay in touch with people. Now, I'm pretty bad at replying because I get too many emails and I can't reply. But I try to stay in touch with a lot of people, try to stay connected. But you've got to do that as a discipline, especially when you're starting off in life. Reply to the dots, reply. It's, it's impolite. It, it shows you don't care if you don't reply to the dots. So just remember, life, it's all about, it's all about the dots.
and uh, and that's something which is important to uh, to stay to remember. It's all about the dots, staying in touch with them. Uh, and this list over here is something which I found very useful in life to keep me going. I've also talked about to people about the fact that I've been lucky. And some people, you know, would say, you know, Lewis, people create the luck for themselves. And I said, I have no idea. So, so the two things I do when I need to get information or I'm in doubt, one is ask my wife or I go to Google. So I Googled, what do lucky people do? And I came up with this, with this thing about four habits of lucky people. And I think it's, it's interesting for people to read about this because it's all about connecting to how, how you can create opportunities for, your, for yourself, which you otherwise don't have. So the first is maximize these chance opportunities. If you did the same thing every day in the same way, going to work in the same manner, talking to the same people, having lunch with the same people, you're not going to have a chance to experience something new. Try a different route. I keep telling my um, the people I mentor, when you're on a train, talk to somebody new. Talk to uh, the random person on the train. Have a conversation. Who knows what it will lead to? There's one of my friends who uh, I've been in touch with now, for, I think over 10 years, or maybe longer, about 10, 15 years. We met each other on a train. I was reading something which had Chicago booth on it. He was applying to Chicago booth. He said, did you go there? We started talking and he then also went to Chicago booth and we've been friends since then. So maximize these chance opportunities. Use them. Don't do the same thing every day. Try new things. Go out and meet, you know, go for events which you otherwise would not normally go for. This is the chance for you to create opportunities for yourself. Listen to your gut instinct. Don't do everything instantaneously, but listen to what your gut's saying. What, what is it that you feel about? Because quite often it's your gut which tells you. I, it's different from doing things rashly. Analyze it, but also listen to your gut instinct. Third is expect to be lucky. And go back to that thing I talked about earlier in the force model about uh, positivity. You've got to be able to expect lucky. If you you you, you've got to have, literally have this attitude that I'm, something is which is going to happen to me and things will happen. And fourth thing is find the good in anything. When things go bad, we can grumble and be morose. I look at it instead and say, what can I learn from this episode? What is it that I can, what, what can I learn from why things didn't go right this time? And uh, find the good in everything. That's important because this way, you will convert a bad situation into something that can be positive. And by the way, I just picked up, and these are not my own thoughts. These are from Richard Wiseman of the University of Hertfordshire. But I just Googled it and I got, and I find this to be very, very sort of helpful over here. The last story I want to leave with you is what a professor talked about uh, to somebody I know. So this guy on the right hand side is a professor of mine. He taught me way back in 1988, I think. And his wife and a classmate of mine who I shared an apartment with when I was at business school. And uh, so Marvin Zonis, the professor, was this professor who taught a course on politics and economics. And uh, he uh, was the guy who really looked after us well, was a great professor. So Bruce and I set up a scholarship in his name. And uh, one year, the recipient of this scholarship was a lady from Pune. So, uh, so she met up with me before she went to Chicago. And I told her, you know, when you land up over there, uh, contact Marvin and tell him you're in town. She didn't. Uh, about 10 days after school, Call has started. Marvin sends her an email. You must have settled in. Let's meet up for lunch. So they met up for lunch and they spent about two hours chatting away. They had a great time. And, uh, and so she, she told him at the end of the lunch, 
But you know, Lewis did tell me that I should get in touch with you. And I just thought that a senior professor will not be interested in talking to a young student. So I did reach out. And what he told her was fascinating. He said, young lady, life is complicated enough. Don't complicate it more by negotiating against yourself. And that's the lesson which, you know, we got to think about so many times we say no to an opportunity in our own head without asking the person. We want to raise money from X, Y, Z. If they say, nah, the person's not going to give us the money, let me not even ask. As someone said, the probability of a positive response if you haven't asked is 0%. So stop negotiating in your mind against yourself. Let the other person say no. If you haven't asked that person for money, the probability of that person giving you money is zero. If you ask, maybe the person will say yes. Maybe the person will say no. Send a mail to somebody if you want to meet the person. What's the worst that can happen? The person will say no or the person won't reply. But at least let that person say no. At least you've tried over here. So in networking, to me, the big lesson learned is what I learned from Marvin. Never negotiate with yourself. That's really what I want to talk about. May the force be with you as you seek. I'm a star. I'm interested in Star Wars and I'm interested in Calvin and Obes. So, so this is where we are. Priyanka, can I turn over to you for uh, walking us through the questions? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Louis. It was fun. Uh, Listening to you and the presentation was really cool. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions with us already and I'll request participants to share their questions in the chat or the Q&A window with us. Uh, meanwhile, there's a question which says, uh, what's the approach to set targets for a fundraising team? And in addition, the same participant asks that corporates want very detailed proposals, especially around numbers. How do we manage them? Okay. Okay. So first is, what's the approach for uh, for fundraising? I think it's the basic thing is first of all figure out how much you need. So if you're in a nonprofit and you first figure out what's your budget going to be for the year, and therefore how much money do you need? Because people are going to ask you, what do you need this money for? You've got to add the details for it. So especially when you're a new organization, you don't know enough. You don't know how much to ask for. So there will be some element of variability in it or some element of vagueness in the proposal. But corporate CSR guys, any donor will want to see some idea about how much you want and where the money is going to go. So, so as you sort of look at uh, fundraising, keep in mind that it's all linked to what you want to sort of in, uh, invest it or spend it on. And uh, that sort of helps you determine how much to fundraise. Bear in mind, again, there's something called a reality check. You're a new nonprofit. You are uh, looking to start up in your first year. And you have no experience in fundraising. You say, I'm going to raise five crore in the first year. You're not going to get it. It's going to be extremely difficult unless you have a rich uncle who will give you five crore. But otherwise, it's uh, be realistic about how much you can Talk to people around you. Uh, it's good to have a mentor who can help you bring some sanity into the numbers. Uh, and uh, that will help you sort of, you know, figure out how much to learn. I keep coming across in non-profit. We spent three crore last year. Next year, the budget is 10 crore. And I'm going to say, you know, how are we going to, first of all, operate and spend 10 crore next year? Two is, do we have the team to be able to expand our business three times? And uh, people have not thought about that. So you will be grilled by donors asking for how much money you have and, uh, and, what, and, and, you know, and what you're going to use this money for. So I'm afraid there's nothing more you can do about it. You have to learn to live with a fair proposal, which can, doesn't have to, it depends again on how detailed it can be or how, uh, how much the detail the corporate wants or the donor wants, but you, you've got to be able to defend those numbers. Yeah, Priyanka. Great. Uh, thank you, Louis. There's another question, which is, um, how do you handle connections which have supported you in the past without, being overbur without overburdening them every time? Great question. 
Um, so I, I struggled with that myself. So there are people who, who you know, who given money for some of the causes uh, I, I am associated with, and if you only them to talk about raising money, so you raise money from them, you forget about them, and then go back a year later and ask again for money. <laughs> You're always going to be like a little sort of, you know, I'm, I'm coming to you only all the time for money. Maybe it's useful to meet them occasionally, depending on how busy they are, and just give them an update on what you're doing. <laughs> for example, you raise money from an H&I, maybe one, maybe three or four months, meet up with them and just tell them, you know, what is it that you're doing? What are some of the challenges they're facing? Get them involved in helping you solve your problems. Some people don't want to be involved. Some people like to be involved. So ask them, how often should I stay in touch with you? Uh, it's useful also to write to people about what happened with their money. Uh, they may not read it, but at least you can't be found guilty of not giving them information. I remember years back, there's one uh, organ, a social enterprise, which had asked me for some money and I gave them, and uh, I didn't hear back from them. So when they met with me about a year later, I, the first thing I said was, no, you never came back. And I hear this repeatedly when at some of the organizations I'm involved with, when I, when I came on board and I meet some old donors, they say, I'll never give money again because you know, I gave money three years back and no one stayed in touch with me. So it's important to stay back even if you don't need money from them. <laughs> because you, you want to show that you care for them. It's important to stay in touch with them. And if they're busy, they're going to tell you they're busy. If they say, listen, don't worry about giving me any information. Just drop me an email with what you want to tell me. And that's enough. At least stay in touch. <coughs> yeah, Priyanka. Okay. Um, another question is, how critical is networking for people working on the ground versus those leading organizations? Okay, you know, again, network is, is not only meant for people at the top. It's for everyone. When I was a young banker at Citibank, <coughs> I was in treasury sales. I spent my time networking. It's because I needed to get business in for Citibank and I would talk to people and I would meet them and I would tell them ideas and understand what their needs are and try to figure out a solution for their needs. And uh, it's interesting that over the years, this one gentleman, for example, who was a client of mine at Citibank, uh, and uh, many years later, when I was at uh, IDFC, we invested in a company which was one of their subsidiaries. And it was a lot to do also with the fact that we had this relationship which went back 20 years. Yeah, about 20 years. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's therefore important to stay in touch with some of these people right from the beginning. Because I mentioned, you know, as you grow in your organization, they will also grow and they will become big and you will also become big. <laughs> and then instead of now when everyone's become a senior person, then trying to build a relationship is more difficult. So networking is important when you're a junior person, when you're working on the ground. For example, Suppose you're in Wardad and you're working on a particular project there. You're working with the district magistrate, you're working with some branch manager. Who knows? Maybe that district manager, the magistrate, will become a senior IAS officer somewhere later. And uh, when you guys are 20 years older, you'll have a relationship with that person. I'm meeting today some people who are chairman of banks, as I mentioned earlier who were dealers like I was way back in 89, 90. And uh, today they've risen to the top and I'm sort of, you know, have a relationship with them just because we knew each other at that time. So networking is important all the time. And that's, you know, it's interesting if when you're going to school and you're, or you're going to business school or you're going to a college, learn if you can the importance of negotiations and selling. Because in life, that's one which we don't spend enough time selling and negotiation skills. It's so important in life because all the time you're selling, all the time you're negotiating, 
And if you have young kids, they're going to be negotiating even more all the time. They'll teach you how to negotiate. Do you have anything else, Priyanka? Yes. Uh, very quickly. So another question, how do you get honest feedback from funders who have rejected your proposal? <laughs> yep. It's a, uh, I think you just be just asking, ask them, why is it that you didn't give us the money? And, uh, you may not get an honest answer, but at least ask that question. Uh, and, and the way you frame it is, you know, you, 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 uh, you know, we're disappointed that you turned on our proposal. You know, we'd like to understand how, what we did wrong or how we could have done something differently or how we can improve what we're doing, or we can figure out how we can make it more active, more, uh, important or necessary for you. So could you spare some time and tell me why? Now, now a person may say, listen, I don't have time, but at least you try to get that feedback. Or the person may give you honest feedback as to why it didn't make sense. Or the person may be polite and not give you the true answer. But at least you ask the question. Why did you, you know, how could we have done things differently? Maybe it's something that, you know, it didn't fit into the strategy. Or maybe they think that the numbers you give didn't make sense. Or maybe they just felt that you were not experienced enough to be able to deliver on what you said you would do. So the answers, the reasons could be very different. But ask people. And, and that's again, you know, so instead of negotiating in our own mind as to what the reason possibly could be, just ask them. And you'll be able to get an answer, hopefully, as to why they did fund you or turn on your proposal. And these are lessons that you can then use, maybe not to go back to the same person, but at least to go back to the next time when you're raising money in the else. <laughs> Always validate what you do. Always keep questioning yourself. What could I do differently? Don't blame other people for it. Always, if something turns back, as I said, you know, look at the good in everything. Someone turned it on. Okay, what can I learn from that experience? And believe you me, when you're fundraising, you possibly get turned down four out of five times. So, and when I mean, you're fundraising in private equity, you possibly get turned down nine out of ten times. So, leave your ego aside. You're going to get your ego bashed up tremendously when you're fundraising. But it'll help you become a better person. It'll teach you empathy, teach you selling, teach you negotiation, and help you basically frame the value proposition clearly. <laughs> when I look back at you, when I look at sometimes people who come to me and ask you for money, and when I ask them, what is it that you're trying to do? <laughs> if someone can't in three sentences explain what they're doing, then they don't know what they're doing. It's as simple as that. So if someone was to spend 10 minutes trying to explain to me what they're doing, then in my view, they don't know what they're doing. So be brief, be too precise, think about pitches. You know, so a lot of people, and I used to do that earlier, practice the pitch before you, uh, before you go meet somebody. You know, you don't, there is so much importance because you may not get the chance again to pitch to that person. So make sure that you've got your, your pitch correctly. Just give me a second. My, I'm getting a message on my computer that I'm going to run out of battery fast. So just correct myself. Yeah, carry on, Priyanka. Yes. Um, so this is an extension of the question that was asked earlier. So how do you approach uh, donors who have rejected your proposal? What sort of mindset is required to approach them? Uh, not uh, just in terms of feedback, but also maybe, again, a request for the, uh, funding. Can you repeat the question again, please? Uh, yeah. So the question is, um, how do you approach the donors who've rejected your proposal? What sort of mindset is required at, the, at this point? Okay. So when someone's rejected it, the best way to engage to this is to ask them for feedback, as the previous question was. You know, ask them for feedback on what you could have done differently. And, uh, and then go back to them with a revised proposal and ask them 
I'm back to you. So I'll give you an example, not so much in the uh, non-profit space, but in the private equity space where I was in. So there was this company who approached us for money and they had a very complicated holding structure. And uh, so we told them, I mean, our, my, our view is that it's very simple. I mean, you tell somebody no, we, we, I think we owe to them to explain why we said no, uh, because uh, it's just being fair and honest. And we told them that the reason why we can't invest in you today is because your ownership structure is too complex and uh, we will not be able to you know, do it uh, in a way that makes sense. And uh, so, uh, so, they, so, uh, so they said, uh, so I said, you know, if you were to fix that, we'll be able to uh, invest in you a year later. And that's we went back fixed all the things that we'd asked them to fix up about their structure, et cetera. And the, and the first people they approached when they got their act together was us. And we made the deal with them. So that's the importance of, you know, if but not every donor or investor is so open, uh, but it is. Now, if you, for example, had told, given someone a proposal that you, know, you acquired one crore for the next three years, and they felt that it was too much and it wasn't worth enough. And you go to them with a revised proposal, which is one tenth of that. Then they're going to say, you know, that the gap is too large. You know, it doesn't, you really didn't understand what you were doing in the first place. And do you still, and then they're going to have the doubts to really understand yourself now. So if you find that you've really gone unprepared for the first meeting, and you come back to them with a proposal that is so different without a logical reason why you're not stupid to have given them the wrong numbers in the first place, it makes it difficult. Uh, but uh, it's always, and then some people also may not be interested in meeting you the second time because they're very busy and they've said no before. <clears throat> so they don't, they don't want to meet you again, so they may just blow you off. So it's, that's why it's so important that when you have the first meeting, you put your best foot forward because you may not get a second chance again. Great. Um, one last question. So um, what could a good proposal look like? If you could just uh, briefly highlight some of its features or uh, to-dos or something of that sort. Okay. Uh, I think a good proposal is something which is precise and understood easily. Writing to somebody, it should not be more than a page. You can have annex to it if someone wants to take the trouble to understand something in more detail. But honestly, if you, it's got to be one page and you, that's what you've got to tell them about it. If you're making a presentation, take, and also what's very important is don't have spelling mistakes. Make sure your grammar is correct. Typos. All these are signs that you are not professional or that you don't care and you're not attentive to the details. So review your proposals, telling them because it's so important that you have uh, that you sort of go to them with your best foot forward. Uh, people on presentations and today I went through the similar thing at office. If someone had come to do a presentation and there was so much information on the slide in such tiny font that no one could read it. What the font? So Google, you can Google this guy called Guy Kawasaki, G-U-I-K-A-W-A-S-K-I. And he has a 10, 20, 30 rule. Not more than 10 slides, uh, 20 minutes, 30 size font. And it's so effective because you know, a lot of people say that I have so much information I want to give, but if you're going to be sort of putting it onto the slide and reading from the slide, then why do you need to be there for the presentation in the first place? So use 30 size font so people can read the slide. Don't spend more than 20 minutes on your pitch and not more than 10 slides. It's a great lesson. It's a great discipline. It's just people to then say, listen, this slide is not necessary or you know, I, I just, I'm saying stuff which is superfluous. Prepare very hard for your pitch. 
when we are pitching for money, which is to be successful, a lot of work goes into it. And as as a, as an as example, there's one organization which was preparing for a large grant. I mean, it was huge, bigger than our any budget. Everybody pitching for the stars. Oh, they spent a couple of months working on it to figure out, you know, what, how what are the questions they're going to get asked, what are the responses we are going to give, etc. So, uh, so work hard on that. Uh, there's no shortcuts for hard work. And if you look back at the force model, H was hard work. And you've got to do that. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Lewis. I think that's about it with the questions from our participants. Uh, and that brings us to the end of today's webinar in the ISDM knowledge series. Once again, thank you very, very much, Luis, for sharing all of this uh, really useful information with us. And thank you, participants, for being there and engaging with us. Stay tuned for more on ISDM Knowledge Series. Thank you. And thanks, Priyanka, and thanks, ISDM, for this opportunity. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.